When we think of metatropes in media, we often look at characters like Marvel's Deadpool, candidly staring down the lens or out to the comic towards the viewer, breaking the beloved fourth wall. Some pieces of fiction have even attempted to create the whole concept around the fourth wall, with one of the most extreme versions being The Purple Rose of Cairo, a film about a woman watching a film over and over again, and a character in said film realising this and leaving the film to join her, leading to the actor in the film hunting down the character in the real world. Confusing, right? But this video is not about films, and in the gaming industry, a few games have really attacked the walls of meta. For example, in the anime visual novel hit, Doki Doki Literature Club, one of the characters is openly aware they're in a game, and in evidence the last ritual, the game uses its investigative gameplay as a meta tool, forcing the player to search real-life websites to solve puzzles in-game. Even as far back as the early 90s, games were breaking the fourth wall with Sonic's bored idle animation staring out the screen at AFK players. But back in 2011, Galactic Cafe took this concept a step further, creating the Stanley Parable. The game had the player take on the role of Stanley, an office worker who is directed by the narrator to do certain things in order to progress the story. Throughout the game, the player is given choices, allowing them to disobey the narrator. These choices create branching stories, for example, in one, Stanley completely follows the narrator's instructions and is set free. In another, Stanley is found dead in the street by a woman named Mariella. Although yes, this is extremely meta, the concept is still locked in the seriousness of a game. The player takes on a role and the designers play the role of the narrator. One of the lead designers decided to take this concept further in his perhaps less renowned title, The Beginner's Guide. After completing the remake of The Stanley Parable, Davy Worden and William Pugh went on their creative separate ways with the latter creating the Berlin-based Crows 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 studio, working with the likes of Rick and Morty's Justin Roiland on games. Davy Worden, on the other hand, created The Beginner's Guide under the banner of Everything Unlimited Limited. This in my opinion is the most meta slash fourth wall breaking game ever created, and disclaimer, as a game designer it has heavily inspired me. The game is narrated by Word and himself and directly speaks to the player throughout the journey, even starting by handing out his own email address. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. This game is about a fellow game designer simply named Coda, who Werden was an acquaintance and admirer of until Coda stopped creating games in 2011. These games were never released publicly and Werden only got to view them because of his friendship with Coda. These games were simply a creative outlet for Coda, and once they had finished one project they would simply drop it and move on to the next. Throughout the game, each level is one of Coda's games with Werden explaining his thoughts and concept in each one and his feelings upon playing them for the first time. Instantly for me, I felt quite uneasy playing the game. To be playing a collection of games created by someone who never intended for them to be released feels as intimate as reading someone's diary. At the start we play some games created before Word and Met Coda, with the narrator commenting on how he felt the first time playing these games. At first, a lot of the concepts in the game seem to be just done for fun or as a little prototype of an idea, and that is a fair argument, but every game seems to send a message. For example, one of the early games has the movement controls disabled except for backwards, meaning the player must walk through the level with their back to where they're going. In the level, there is messages written on the walls saying, The past was behind her, but the future could not be seen. Why does the future keep changing? When she stops and looks, it becomes clearer. But if the future was always behind her, how will she find the strength to confront it? A little poem linked to the game below hinting at the concept of facing the future instead of staying in the past or simply looking to the past. There seems to be a general theme in the games of having the narrative and gameplay be linked in a certain way. In another game, the player tries to climb a staircase up to a room, but as you get up the stairs, the player's movement is slowed to a snail's pace, making it incredibly hard to reach the top. Worden fixes this for the player, and you reach the room seeing it filled with game ideas, some of which are created as later games in the beginner's guide. As the games get more abstract and the meaning becomes more complex, Worden explains his worries for Coda, and how he feels his friend is spiralling and losing touch with people in reality. The games to Worden show frustration and depression. Also, in the games, a consistent end goal appears, an old-fashioned lamppost which is the ending point of every game. Werden explains this by saying, I think up to this point he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe he can only float around in that headspace for so long, because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination. This is extremely important and probably why the art of the game is littered with the lampposts, but we'll get back to that later. Another recurring concept is the puzzle door. The door has a switch on one side that opens the first door leading to a second closed door and a dark space in between. The puzzle is solved by closing the first door once the player is in the gap between the two doors and switching a switch on the back of the first door opening the second door. The puzzle, according to Worden, is all about closing a door on one thing and opening to the next part, a fresh start. 
Raiden then tells the player that he decides to show the games to friends so that Cordip could be celebrated as that gratification has always made himself feel good. He describes how this presentation of Coda's art made himself feel good as well. The concern for Coda continues as the games seem to get more extreme in Warden's opinion, which all leads to the tower. Tower is a final game Warden received from Coda and is where Coda breaks the fourth wall himself. The game has multiple parts that are extremely difficult such as the invisible maze or are just simply impossible such as a room full of locked doors. Obviously Warden fixes these leading to the climax. I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? It's because of what I did. I poisoned it for you. I don't think I ever told you this, but when I took your work and I was showing it to people, it actually felt... <laughs> it felt as though I were responsible for something important and valuable. And the people who played them, they treated me like I was important. They really listened and cared about what I had to say. Even though I was showing your work, it was... I felt good about myself. Finally. For a moment, while I had that, I liked myself. And then you stopped. And I didn't have anything left to show people. I, I just had to be with myself. And as soon as that happened, there was no feeling at all. Nothing. Less than nothing. What does that mean? I'm afraid that I did something really stupid because I don't like myself. That's why I'm releasing this collection of your work, is because I haven't been able to find any other way to reach you. I've tried everything, and so a part of me has hope that if I put this compilation out into the world, and if I put my name on it, that maybe enough people will play it so that it'll find its way to you, so that I can tell you that I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? Please, I need to feel okay with myself again. And I always felt okay as long as I had your work to see myself in. I mean, is, is something wrong with me? Because I know that I did an awful thing, and I'm doing it again right now. Like, I'm, I'm showing people your work, but I can't stop myself from doing it. That's how badly I need to feel something again. Like, I'm an addict. There has to be something wrong with me. Can I apologize? What if I tell you I was wrong? Will that work? Will that fix it? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it will, but there's nothing else that I can do. Just tell me what you want. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Start making games again. Please help me. Please give me some of whatever it is that, that makes you complete. I want whatever that wholeness is that you just summoned out of nothing and you put into your work. You were complete in some way that I never was. And I want to know how to, how to, I want to know how to be a good person. I want to know how not to hate myself. Please. I'm fading. And all I want is to know that I'm going to be okay. This leads to the final level which is presumably created by Werden, and well, it is sad, or I think it is meant to be perceived that way. Although the work is quite Coda-esque, having the creators sat telling you how they feel makes it hard to find any meaning except the one being narrated to you. More, 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 more love, more praise, more people telling me that I'm good. Always more, more, more. It's like a disease. Often throughout the beginner's guide I created my own opinions on an even field as word and feeling as if he was observing the game just as much as I was. So having that flipped is uncomfortable. The game reviewed fair of 76% on Metacritic, with some outlets like the Washington Post and Good Game giving it 100%. Other outlets such as PC Gamer with 69 out of 100 and Shack News with 3 out of 10 rated it lowly. 
This seems to me comes from their expectations of games. Track News argues that the game is a sadly self-indulgent exercise that requires little thought or little input from the player to complete. And I can't argue with that. It is. The game has very little gameplay. The story is all about a person and his friend. As a writer says, why should we care? But for me, this shows games as an art form. Why should we go look at a piece of art? Why should we start classic literature for hidden concepts and the writer's imprint on a story? You don't have to and that is perfectly fine, but for a game to be so emotional and thought provoking is unique to me. You're forced into immersion into this internal conflict of word and encoder. This is unique to any visual media I've seen. So let's start breaking up the core concept. As we know, the lampposts are not from Corda, they are from Werden. Werden constantly changes the game from what Corda originally envisioned, and this is especially highlighted by a piece of dialogue where Werden explains that him and Corda would argue about whether a game should be playable or not. Werden argues they have to be, otherwise there's no point playing, but Corda doesn't, and in retaliation he sends Werden hundreds of games, each just being an empty box you can walk around. For me, Werden was gifted a view into Corda's creative endeavours, and because he did not like what he was given, he had to change them to make them fit him. He fixed impossible or near impossible sections for people, he showed us hidden parts, and finally he added lampposts. He added an ending, but also a huge fingerprint. Now this is definitely up for discussion like the whole game, so chime away in the comments on your thoughts. But for me, Werden played every game looking for something, and Corda created with full freedom. Werden added the lamppost as his anchor. He knew its meaning, so that was tangible and safe for him. The main focus of a story is his destination. When he couldn't find one, he gave himself one to feel comfortable. Now the biggest thing was him showing the game to others against Corda's wishes, and it is obvious why this is bad. But Werden commented that he felt important when showing them, and that he finally felt good obviously links to Corda's line, the fact that you think I am frustrated or broken shows more about you than about me, and that Werden is using Corda for his own mental health issues by projecting them into the games. After Tower, Werden begs Corda to restart making games, showing he has not fixed his issues and still feels he needs Corda. Werden did not do any press around the release of the game, and has always pushed for players to create interpretations instead of releasing his own. Before I get into the main interpretations, I want to first say something I knew from the start of making this. Corda is fictional. Werden confirmed this a few years later, but did not add much more. I believe the game really needs to be viewed first without this knowledge to first fall for the idea of it being real. Of course, legally, releasing someone else's work against their will is illegal, so really this concept is impossible without a lawsuit. The most popular idea is that Coda is Werden, and the narrator is fictional, or perhaps also Werden, but the two sides of him. Coda is his creative side from the past, and the narrator is his dark side from releasing the Stanley Parable and dealing with the stress of his success. This is supported by the room with all the game ideas, as some of the ideas have clear links to the Stanley Parable. Another interpretation is that the game is a commentary on the roles of creator and audience, with one taking a piece of art and trashing it by making it their own and attempting to force the artist to add meaning where they do not want to, or to make interpretations and force the world to view the artist in a certain way. For example, in the game Werden talks about telling people how sick Coda was with depression and feeling bad for that. How would that have affected Coda having the people around him worried for his well-being because of an opinion of his creations? This links to another fourth wall break from another game. Scott Cawthorn's Five Nights at Freddy's series. The series had a ton of speculation on the story as it really had very little in the game. This led to him creating a character called Mr. Hippo, which has extremely long dialogue upon killing the player. In one of these he says, Orville, I have a story to tell you. And Orville looked at me, you know, kind of odd and, and said, well, what's it about? I, I said to him, not every story has to be about something, Orville. Sometimes a person just wants to talk. Why does... Everything have to be a story, I said to him. This is a nod to the players constantly searching for meaning. And finally, some have argued that maybe the game is as it seems and Coda really exists. Maybe Werden is trying to cover his back by claiming it's fictional. But I guess we'll never truly know until and if Coda comes forward. Thank you for watching the video. This is a bit of a different video for me. This is something I haven't made before, but it's been something I've wanted to try for a long time. I've been inspired by channels like Ed Ake and No Clip to kind of look at topics or a film, game, whatever, and to kind of look at it more deeply. And that is, I saw um, 
Eddig do this a lot with films where they just look at one concept and look at it deeper. Him and No Clip kind of focus more on the creation of it. But this game, The Beginner's Guide, is something I really, it's a game I really, really enjoy. And I think there's a lot to dig from it. And I think it's really pushing games further because I've hardly seen games do this type of thing. But there wasn't much around the creation of it. It is very quiet. And I think that's done on purpose to kind of keep this weird, mystifying thing about it. So I'd like to, you know, kind of cause more discussion with this game. If you'd like me to do a video breaking down more in detail the game in terms of, you know, each game in the game, each level, then um, I'll do that if there's a desire for it or, you know, there's other concepts in games that I'd like to talk about. Um, myself, I'm a game design student in my final year and games like this are the type of things I want to make. I want to make interesting either story games or, you know, something that is small but very creative and very... I guess different in the sense of it's not just for entertainment, it's not just for a fun game, something that is going to question further, like a book would or, you know, certain small films. And I really like games like this one that does that, uh, and the Stanley Parable as well. So yeah, if you like that, subscribe. I also have a Twitch channel that will stream games on like this, or just fun games like Apex Legends and stuff like that. That will be down in the description. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to plan on try and do one video a month of this style, but th that will depend on uni stuff. And yeah, these videos take a while with editing and writing and everything. And I'm also not very good at VO right now. <laughs> but if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Twitch, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.